Chantol, Sakuma, But I'm not. I'm not staying. I, I'm, I have to go down to give the. Um okay. Oh, you got. I you, you're all. You got your seat in there. Okay. Does everybody have their seat? You're here. The moderator. And then. Yes. And who is Domingo? Where is Domingo? <laughs> there is Domingo. Okay. Oh, uh, where's Domingo? Well, what's over here? Yeah. Hi, Dad. Okay. Good to see you. Nice to see you. You're okay? Okay. So now, uh, could we ask uh, here the people in the front to sit down so that uh, we can take the proverbial, please, all of you stand up. All of you, all the ministers, please stand up. So that we can take the, um, the the family picture, please. Please sit down, please sit down. It's okay, Nora. Okay? Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. Please sit down. I'd like to welcome everyone to this panel, Focus on Southeast Asia. I have the pleasure of moderating this session. My name is Hiroko Kunia with Japan's Public Television. As you can see, we have a very big panel. Somebody asked me, is this going to be the ASEAN ministerial meeting? <laughs> Actually, uh, <laughs> we have uh, six political leaders from the ASEAN member countries. And uh, this shows that uh, there's strong interest towards the OECD from the ASEAN member economies. And I'd like to say that um, this panel is quite symbolic for the OECD as well, because OECD is stepping up its engagement and strategically collaborating with the ASEAN, East Southeast Asian economies so that it can support its economies to strengthen the regional competitiveness and also to sustain for sustained economic um, growth. Um, and also for OECD, it shows that its interest in rebalancing itself geographically, I would say. Um, tomorrow, um, OECD will be officially launching the Southeast Asia Regional Program, which is aimed to create a platform uh, so that the economies can foster exchanges of ideas and best practices among the countries. Um, first, before we start the panel, I would like to invite the Secretary General of OECD, Angel Guerrilla, to um, present OECD's perspective towards this region, why it is focusing on Southeast Asia. Mr. Secretary General, please. Thank you very much, uh, Madam. Thank you for uh, moderating our session. Dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our Southeast Asia panel at the OECD Forum. With a panel, we mark the beginning of two days of events which will culminate with the launch of the OECD Southeast Asia Regional Program 
the day of tomorrow. For the OECD, this is a critical undertaking, as our members are convinced that to continue to be as relevant as it has been so far, the organization needs stronger links and stronger involvement with the countries that integrate this important region. Through our discussions, we aim not only to identify policies that can continue promoting competitiveness in Southeast Asia, but also to support the ongoing efforts to ensure that growth is inclusive and that it is equally shared. We further aspire to enrich our own knowledge from the best practices in the region, of which there are so many, and to share those lessons learned with our own members and with a growing number of emerging and developing economies. Now, the OECD engagement with Southeast Asia comes at a crucial time. The economies in the region have benefited from positive growth rates since the early 2000s and have recovered faster than the advanced economies from the effects of the global crisis. Growth prospects are looking good, too. According to our 2014 economic outlook for Southeast Asia, which we shared with you uh, a few minutes ago, uh, it, which explores uh, policy areas where the region can focus, um, GDP growth rates are projected to average 5.4% per annum to 2018. I'd normally say a whopping 5.4% to uh, 2018, when, especially when we compare it to the numbers you're going to listen to uh, tomorrow uh, of the economic outlook of the OECD region. Now, more than half of this growth has been productivity growth. That's another outstanding feature of this region. It shows how countries in the region are moving up the global value chain. We're talking about global value chains. Actually, right now, there is a seminar going on on global value chains. Indeed, they have become very important players in global trade. Their total exchange of goods and services from, 90, from 985 billion in 2008. 2008 is only six years ago, five to six years ago. So let's say rounding up one trillion to now 1.4 trillion in 2012. So Amazing growth, uh, more than 8 to 10 percent per year, but in the middle of the biggest crisis that the uh, world has seen in the last decades. So very, very important. Southeast Asia's competitiveness has also improved significantly. It's also reflecting the increased inflows of foreign direct investment to the region. According to UNCTAD, ASEAN countries drew 100 and 16 billion in foreign direct investment in 2013. 8% of the world's foreign direct investment, approximately double the average uh, of the figures from 2005 to 2007. Now, these figures tell a remarkable story, but indeed, despite this dynamism, there are many challenges which the countries in the region have to face. For example, many countries in the region have now reached a stage where they need to move up the global value chain to achieve higher levels of income and development. Most of these economies still need to sustain strong productivity growth to close the gap in relative living standards. Even within the region, within the region there are clearly uh, uh, you know, two, at least two levels of development uh, within the uh, Southeast Asian uh, region. And clearly, there has to be a uh, convergence uh, within the region itself. Structural reforms in key sectors are needed, as well as the development of a modern services sector. South countries are highly integrated in global value chains. In fact, they were the first to start doing this massively. But to remain competitive, new policies are needed for sustaining trade integration supporting the creation of domestic entrepreneurial capacities, and also SMEs which contribute to international trade rather than just being domestic. 
The region also needs to continue its efforts to achieve its goal of regional economic integration, a massively ambitious goal, and that's only next year. Um, in this respect, the ASEAN Economic Community constitutes uh, this one of the most ambitious programs of economic integration in the world. And last but not least, the region, of course, looks uh, for a very strong social agenda to develop the necessary safety nets, to overcome poverty, exclusion, and ensure that the benefits of growth are widely shared. Indeed, fostering inclusive growth is the most important challenge of all. And I have to say, ministers, inclusive growth was the object of the forum. Inclusive growth, jobs, and trust are the three main issues of the forum here. So we need a common vision of what it is that the region and the integration of the region with the rest of the economies in the world and the OECD should be within 20, 30 years. Um, and uh, to that, our members have said, let's launch a full uh, economic, comprehensive uh, Southeast uh, Asia regional program. That's, as I said, what we're doing tomorrow. The program in its first phase will focus on policy supporting tax, investment, regulatory reform, uh, PPPs for infrastructure, SMEs, and then education and skills, areas, all areas in which the OECD has been doing extensive work for all its members and a growing number of non-members for many decades now. In fact, we've done some of the regulatory work for some of you already uh, at uh, the request of some of the members of some of these countries. Um, innovation, trade, gender issues, these are also uh, things that uh, we're going to be pursuing. Um, and actually, we did this innovation study for Southeast Asia for the region as a whole. And now we're looking at the possibility of working with individual uh, country members. The program will also enhance and broaden the OECD's knowledge of the region and foster the exchange of good practices and mutual learning between policymakers in Southeast Asia and the OECD. We want to borrow from the vibrancy, the dynamism, the resolve, the success of the Southeast Asia region to uh, use a little bit uh, ourselves. Uh, I think we, we need it at this time. So ladies and gentlemen, dear ministers, dear friends, through our discussions today and tomorrow, we hope to open the door to closer cooperation and ensure that the dynamism of the region is sustained, but also that it can be shared. We warmly welcome your contributions, your ideas on how to shape this new regional program. It is going to be you, the countries in the region, it is going to be you, the ministers, you, the policymakers in the region, that we would expect to tell us what it is that uh, your priorities are, so that we can tend to them. So count on us, feel comfortable with us, use the OECD. It is here to work with you and for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General. Um, as the Secretary General just commented, the Southeast Asian economies are growing very rapidly and their middle class is expanding very quickly and the potential is high. And just to let you know in the audience what is happening in Southeast Asia right now is that the ASEAN 10 member countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Countries are in the process of integrating a market, a single market and also a, create a production base. And um, it is a market with population of 600 million, uh, much larger than the European Union. And the um, blueprint that the uh, ASEAN has created is that to form a single market, uh, free flow of goods um, by the end of next year, 2015, and with few exceptions for the uh, 
countries that have uh, joined uh, later. But these countries are Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. But these countries will also be catching up very quickly. And also, they look for a free flow of financial services in the future. So this is a very ambitious uh, plan of economic cooperation, and they're trying to create a ASEAN Economic Community, AEC. And uh, what is very ambitious is that they are trying to integrate, at the same time, trying to narrow the development gap uh, amongst themselves. So in this panel, um, Secretary General pointed out a number of challenges the ASEAN Economic Community faces. We would like to ask the uh, distinguished uh, panelists about how they are trying to overcome the difficulties and the challenges there is. Let me introduce our panel. First, uh, <laughs> from uh, Thailand, Mr. Surapong Tobichkak Chakikul. He's the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs <laughs> in Thailand. Uh, next from Laos, Mr. Thonglong Sisulis. He's the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> and Indonesia, uh, Mr. Tatib Basuri. He's the Minister of Finance. And from the Philippines, uh, we have Mr. Gregory Domingo. He's the Secretary of Trade and Industry. And uh, Mr. Kanzao, Minister of National Planning and Economic Development from the Republic of Union of Myanmar. And Myanmar is the chair of ASEAN this year. And uh, next from Cambodia, Mr. Sun Shanthal. He's the Minister of Commerce and Vice Chairman of the Council for the Development of Cambodia. And from Australia, uh, from New, I'm sorry, from New Zealand, Mr. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> please excuse me. <laughs> Tim Grossner, Minister of Trade, Minister of Climate Change, and uh, Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs of New Zealand. And. Um, from Japan, Mr. Soichiro Sakuma. He's the uh, representative director of executive vice president of the world's second largest company, Nippon Steel and Sumitomo Metal Corporation. Um, and, uh, and Mr. Did I? Mr. Uh, Chandra Nar is the founder and CEO of GIFT, the Global Institute for Tomorrow. Did I cover everybody? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very briefly, we have a very distinguished representative from Vietnam. Could you please rise? But uh, he, uh, for uh, personal reasons, will not be able to join the panel. He's not uh, very... His throat is having a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, a problem, uh, but, uh, but he is with us, and we'd like to express our appreciation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. So this is our panel. Um, OK, um, since this is a, uh, AEC is a very ambitious uh, uh, planning for economic cooperation, and one of the uh, biggest uh, issue is how to uh, overcome the development uh, levels and, and, and to narrow the development gap. And uh, I would first uh, like to ask the uh, panelists from the um, uh, Myanmar, uh, Laos, Vietnam, uh, I'm sorry, you are not going to be speaking, um, to talk, to tell, let us talk about, in Cambodia, about how you plan to narrow the uh, development gap. What are your policy priorities? What are the areas that you think you need to concentrate on, on structural reforms? And I would like to ask, uh, first of all, from uh, uh, Mr. Um, from the Minister of Myanmar, because Myanmar is the uh, chair of ASEAN this year. Mr. Zhao, please. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Excellencies, Secretary General, Excellencies, ASEAN min Economic Ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
Good evening. It is my pleasure to be here and to give a remarks at this OECD Forum 2014. First of all, I would like to express my sincere thanks and deep appreciation to OECD and the Government of Japan for kindly inviting to participate in this event. Also allow me to express my profound thanks to the organizers of the excellent arrangement made for this forum. The OECD and the Southeast Asian nations, ASEAN, has a long history of engagement. The cooperation between ASEAN and OECD began with the OECD Ministerial Council adopting the resolution in May 2007 to expand OECD relations with Southeast Asia. Since then, cooperation efforts have been growing mainly through pursuing a strategy of engagement at both national and regional levels. Investment policy reviews are also undertaken jointly by the OECD and the government of the country concerned based on the Policy Framework for Investment, PFI. Myanmar appreciates and welcome OECD Southeast Asian Regional Program that could strengthen the strong partnership between OECD and ASEAN. Trade reviews and investment review mechanism are needed to be reviewed and improvement for the ASEAN to become FTI destination among the region. I do appreciate OECD for the publication of multi-dimensional review on Myanmar and the recommendations made that are very helpful for us who are conducting reform processes in the country. Moreover, it is being conducted for the collaboration of OECD and concerned ministries. Exting Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome the OECD Southeast Asia Regional Program, which will be launched at the OECD Ministerial Council meeting tomorrow. The program, which aims, will aim to strengthen policy making in the wide varieties of areas, such as taxes, investment, education and skills, small and medium-sized enterprises, regulatory reform, and public-private partnership. I hope that these policies areas will contribute to the objective of the 2015 ASEAN Economic Community, AEC, just mentioning by the moderator. Taking this opportunity, I would like to highlight the ASEAN Economic Community 2015. ASEAN has achieved substantial progress toward the establishment of ASEAN Economic Community. However, the creation of the AEC will bring increased attention on the need to equitably share the benefits of economic growth and development, both within and between member states. ASEAN identified equitability as a common goal through the establishment of ASEAN Framework of Equitable Economic Development, AFEAT, in 2011. AFEAT now serves as a guiding framework for member states to enable regional economic integration based on the principle of inclusive and sustainable growth poverty alleviation and narrowing the development gaps within and between all ASEAN member states. The goal of the AFEAT monitor will be to improve the ability of ASEAN member states to monitor progress of the ASEAN in achieving the principle of AFEAT, including narrowing the development gap, eliminating extreme poverty, and building resilient to external shock. The AFID monitor will thereby provide ASEAN member states with a common basis for both understanding trends in equitable development across the region and identifying areas of concern, while also 
analyzing factors affecting changes in equitable development and supporting the formulation of ASEAN-wide policies to promote equitable development. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, here I would also like to touch on the AEC priority deliverables under Myanmar chairmanship this year. These priorities deliverables are strengthening regional cooperation for SME development, enhancing public-private partnerships, PPPs, for infrastructure development, and moving ASEAN and AEC beyond 2015. We set these priorities to formulate ASEAN community post-2015 vision collectively in the areas of to promote SMEs as prime engine of ASEAN economic development in 21st century, to promote the sustainable development, to address the growing trends of aging population, to promote resilience in addressing crisis and disaster, and to take a balanced approach to expansion of relation with its dialogue partners. For further development of the economy, small and medium enterprises, SMEs are playing more and more important role in the region. SMEs are recognized as a backbone of economic growth as they contribute significantly to the country's GDP through job creation and income generation while alleviating poverty. SME development is integral to achieve long-run and sustainable economic growth. In promoting the SME development, strengthening regional cooperation is vital to narrow the development gaps in the region. With the assistance of the Economic Research Institutes for ASEAN and East Asia area and OECD, the development of the ASEAN SME Policy Index was completed. The index is envisioned to provide the comprehensive tool for monitoring the implementation of policies and programs and the development of institutions and policies to support SME, as well as for generating effective SME's policy for member states. Regarding the connectivity, the infrastructure development is essential for ASEAN countries to reach our full potential. To narrow the development gap, connectivity, especially physical infrastructure, plays the vital role for inner and intra ASEAN economic integration. PPP mechanism can share the responsibility on mobilizing the funds and technology transfer. We should do more to build framework that will develop strong projects consistent with the national development priorities. In respect to the integration into the global economy, negotiation for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, ASEP, was commenced in 2013, involving ASEAN, its FTA partners, Australia, China, India, Japan, Korea, and New Zealand. Fourth round of negotiation has been completed in April 2014. Participating countries continue to deepen their detail and technical work on trade in goods, trade in services, and investment in the relevant working groups. Work has also begun in other areas with the recent creation of working groups on intellectual property, competition, economic and technical cooperation, and dispute settlements. To sum up, ASEAN is still growing through the significant effort to realization of ASEAN community, as well as ASEAN economic community by end of next year. To be unified, resilient, peace and vibrant region, to deepen economic integration and regional economic development. ASEP will be one of the ambitious, highly integrated economic platform in East Asia and ASEAN, will accelerate the negotiation of ASEP to conclude by 2015. Thus, ASEAN will have many challenges, but we have to overcome them and move up socially, economically by end of next year 
and way forward beyond 2015. In this connection, we look forward to further cooperation with OECD to deepen the existing economic relations, to contribute to the region's integration process, and to promote sustainable and inclusive growth among ASEAN and OECD countries. Another significant factor is that we have to put into consideration of the slowdown of world economic growth, which calls for identifying new growth drivers, such as quality investment, quality job, innovative technology, efficient and effective institutions, HRD and increasing productivity, environmental preservation, and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Those growth drivers are necessary to maintain, to stabilize and strengthen the global economy. From my perspective, we need quality investment, trade facilitation and liberalization, economic opportunities through infrastructure development and employment creation. Moreover, innovative technology and human resource development to enhance productivity, environmental preservation and climate change mitigation. That is why multi-sector cooperation is necessary to be strengthened between OECD and ASEAN member states to sustain the resilience of our economy. On that note, I would like to conclude my remarks by wishing the forum a success. With our dedication, working together, we will have a better future. May we move forward for coordination, collaboration, and communication. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zhao, for your very comprehensive comments on where Asia ASEAN economic community is headed and their expectation towards uh, uh, OECD. But I, next I would like to ask the uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister from Laos about how your country will try to overcome the development gap and narrow the development gap. And I ask you to keep your comments short because we have so many panelists and we would like everybody to have a chance to speak. So. I would ask for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Hiroko uh, Kudia Murirete. The thing is, Delegate Delin Chandaman, it's in my great honor being invited to attend the important forum session on OECD and Southeast Asia. I am of the view that the Team topic for our discussion today is uh, great important and relevant uh, to the current global and regional economic and social development situation. On the question raised by uh, our moderator, it is of uh, particular importance, especially in the narrow narrowing the development gap uh, among ASEAN member states. Therefore, I would like to share my view on the following points. First, on the priority action of uh, a two narrow development gap among ASEAN members. At the present, the ASEAN member states are uh, uh, expediting ASEAN community building process uh, comprising three pillars. Uh, throughout the past years, ASEAN has achieved and steadily progressed in social and economic development in each uh, the member countries. And narrowing the development gap between ASEAN is a key pro uh, priority and this objective need to be realized in order to fully attain ASEAN community building goal. The project uh, and, and the program for uh, narrowing development gap within ASEAN have uh, been 
included in the in Initiative for ASEAN uh, Integration or IAI work plan. The IAI work plan one for 2002 to uh, 2008 have been successfully implemented uh, with the support from uh, all the uh, ASEAN members uh, and dialogue partner and all the uh, external partner. Uh, the AIA work plan 2002, 2009-2015 has been carried out during the last four years. And I have uh, observed that the progress of implementation of uh, uh, is a rather at slow pace. Why many projects have not yet been implemented. Therefore, I am, I am of the view that more efforts uh, are needed in order to expedite the implementation of projects under this work plan by 2015. Moreover, I see the necessity, necessity to uh, continue the implementation of the Initiative for ASEAN Integration, which is one of the top priority in order to ensure that member countries can gain benefit from ASEAN integration, especially the implementation of the existing project list under IAI Work Plan 2 by formulating IAI Work Plan 3. Taking Taking this opportunity, I wish to express my profound thanks and appreciation to all the ASEAN members, dialogue partner, and all the external partner for the support and assistance extended to us, especially to the Laupedia in implementing of uh, uh, the IAI work plan uh, to aiming at the narrow development gap between ASEAN which uh, has uh, gradually brought about tangible outcomes. In this regard, OECD is also involved in IAI work plan too, especially the area of uh, connectivity and skill development. Secondly, on how can national uh, government take uh, uh, taken disparity within the borders. To address development gap with uh, implement, uh, with uh, impede development efforts within the country, uh, taking into account the current challenges, the Lao government need to take ap uh, appropriate action as follow. Of continue to improve and develop more comprehensive legal and regulatory frameworks and ensure that effective implementation so as uh, to create environment conducive for business opportunity and FDI. Continue to develop human resource capacity, especially by uh, upgrading labor skill strengthening capacity and technical know-how. Focus on priority sector of uh, production by introducing a more um, defined and competitive products in regional and international markets and continue to improve basic infrastructure such as transport, communication, and telecommunication system, including electricity and water supply, and strengthen business sector by en enhancing its competitiveness uh, and continue to implement and attain the MDG by 2015. Uh, how, as for how can the OEDC help in narrowing development gap between ASEAN? I would like to 
uh, express my sincere thanks to OADC for uh, selecting our Southeast Asia as a priority, priority for strategic cooperation and development a comprehensive Southeast Asia regional program. I am of the view that OEDC, uh, OECD program which uh, will be launched tomorrow will make important uh, contribution to further enhancing relationship uh, and partnership between ASEAN member countries and OED, OECD. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, to Cambodia, Mr. Sun. Thank you very much. Can I please also join my colleagues uh, for, to congratulate and also to express our appreciation to the OECD and the government of Japan for organizing this important event uh, uh, today. Uh, Cambodia is the youngest member of uh, ASEAN. As you know, so our country suffered tremendously for 30 years uh, uh, during the uh, conflict, internal conflict. So we actually uh, joined ASEAN in 1999. And uh, the first organized election organized by the United Nations was done in 1993. So that the first time that Cambodia actually attained peace in 1993. But the country was not really actual under one government because we have a remnant of the Khmer Rouge that still uh, operate along the border. Not until 1999 that Cambodia actually become one country under one constitution, under one, under one government. And for the past 10 years, we managed to grow our economy at an average of 8%. So how do we go about to try to reduce the gap between the new members and the old members? I think we believe, the Cambodian government believe that the private sector is the engine of our economic growth. So we drafted investment law that allowed uh, the investor to really invest in every sector in Cambodia because Cambodia does not have any financial capital. We don't have human resource, know-how. So we operate in the sense that let's open up a country, liberalize every sector. So we draft investment law that allow the investor to invest in every economic sector in Cambodia. And you can invest up to 100% in any sector. Tell me which country that allow you, to, uh, a foreigner, to own 100% banking license. You can do it in Cambodia. Telecom sector, 100% ownership. Insurance, for example, agriculture. So we do not have any alien business law in Cambodia that we restrict between the foreign and the local investor. So that provide us with the employment that we must create fast. Employment, employment, and employment. So with that, we be able to attract a lot of labor intensive industry first. The garment textile industry that employ over 700,000 workers in Cambodia. So that's how we start the development of our country. But now we move, we move up to value change. We need to uh, uh, we improve, uh, we change shift our strategy from a labor-intensive industry to a semi-skilled industry to a food processing, processing uh, industry. But also it's important for the country to really build infrastructure. If we do not have infrastructure, you cannot build a country. So we invest heavily in road, bridges, airport, seaport. We upgrade our railway to connect our railway, railway to Thailand. Uh, that the first uh, first uh, uh, projects, so that goods and services can be shipped from Singapore to Malaysia to Thailand to Cambodia. Later on, we're going to connect between Cambodia and Vietnam as part of Singapore Kunming Rail Project. So goods and services, people can be shipped from Singapore to Malaysia to Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and all the way to China. So infrastructure is important. For us, so we invest heavily uh, with uh, the support from our development partners and also from the private sector. We believe we believe in the PPP. We believe in BOT, build, operate, and transfer. So a lot of our power plan is built on the uh, uh, BOT basis. Our airport 
we privatize airport, we privatize our air traffic control because we do not have the human resource. So why not invite a foreign investor to invest in a country? Education is extremely important for our country. So we invest heavily in education. But today, there's a mismatch between what we produce from the university and what the private sector required. So we shift, again, we shift our strategy to technical vocational training, a skilled labor force that we are required to supply to the private sector. So that's what we're doing in order to catch up with our neighboring country, or also to reduce the gap between the new and the old members. Like I said, we provide macroeconomic stability. Our GDP grew at average 8% per annum. Our inflation is low, less than 5%. Our exchange rate has been extremely stable for the last 15 years. Our debt to GDP ratio is less than 30%, less than 30%. So we have a lot of room to borrow in order to develop our country. Our workforce, very young, dynamic, the average age between 15 and 64 is 62% of our population. So the next 35 years, we have a very, very young, productive workforce. So when we talk about single market, single product production base, I urge you, I urge you to consider using Cambodia as a center of production for ASEAN. Mr. Sun, thank you. So, so please, uh, please come to see us. We'd be more than happy to welcome you, to guide you, to facilitate you. Our government, our government act as a facilitator of the private sector. Uh -huh. We will not ever, ever be a manager of the private sector. So please come to look around in the country and invest in Cambodia so that we can reduce the gap between Cambodia and the old member of ASEAN. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Very passionate call for investment to Cambodia. I would like to ask Mr. Grosner, because you know the region very well. You were the former um, ambassador to Indonesia, and you are very um, knowledgeable on um, trade negotiations as well. I wonder what the developed countries, the outside countries, can do to help uh, accelerate uh, narrowing the development gap of the uh, ASEAN economic communities, the four countries that are trying to catch up fast. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I, let's just sort of look at this in terms of a passage, a, a narrative which I think unifies this whole process. I remember when I was a junior uh, finance ministry official in the early 70s, uh, we, and I'm sure it would have been the same for my Australian colleagues, saw this region as a region of threat and instability. You'd had confrontation between Indonesia and its neighbours six years previously. The Vietnam War was still winding down. It had massive negative flow-on effects, as our colleague from Cambodia has just forecast, uh, there had been uh, um, a very serious security situation in, in the then Federation of Malaya. So, you know, that's where this grouping has come from. So it's really a tremendous story of progress from a very difficult position. And the first step has been to preserve security and peace. That's been done, uh, largely, though there's still some residual issues uh, of a relatively minor nature to uh, be addressed. The second stage was their own internal cohesion, which has been done. And they followed a model in terms of their own regional integration that if I just make a small point that we were discussing privately, it's quite important for a largely European audience to understand. And that is, unlike the process of integration in Europe, where you've gone for a customs union uh, and therefore ceded in certain areas of policy sovereignty to a supranational body, namely the Commission, these countries have gone for a looser form of cohesion in through a free trade area that in which the ASEAN Secretariat coordinates but does not really propose. So the countries are still in full sovereign control of their futures. Uh, this has allowed them a lot more flexibility to proceed. The um, agenda, as far as I'm concerned, then was 
uh, liberalise their trade regimes. That's been done to a very substantial extent. Uh, it's either complete or as near as complete in terms of their own intra-ASEAN FTA. Uh, they've concluded with Australia and New Zealand a merging of our economies with theirs. Uh, very few people know about it, but it's really a very important precursor to TPP and the other regional uh, trade agreement uh, called the Regional Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, and that will come into effect uh, over the next few years. So already with two advanced countries in the Asia-Pacific region, they are integrating their economies. And of course, ASEAN has stepped up to provide leadership in this other giant mega regional deal that is at a less mature stage than, say, the TPP or Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. But it's all of the countries that have got FTAs with ASEAN. And so it's an ASEAN-driven process. So I think we can say that that phase of their integration with the world is well advanced. Uh, now, what is this really about? Well, I think it's about the next stage, which is behind the border coherence. And that's where I think the OECD uh, can really step up with the mark and help. I mean, what is the OECD? Well, putting aside its roots in the Marshall Plan, and its original very strong European orientation, which is still a source of great strength, of course, uh, it is reaching out to spread what works, good practice, throughout an increasingly large number of partners that the OECD is engaged upon. You know, I think always in this context, the great uh, uh, late Harry Johnson, the, one of the founders of the Chicago School, said, there is only one scarce resource in the world, and that is good decisions. And I think, you know, if you think about Singapore, for example, to take an ASEAN country, I mean, doesn't Singapore exemplify that point, where with almost no resources other than its people, it has achieved an extraordinary success through good decisions? So I think at the end of the day, um, Madam, uh, this is about trying to extend, it's up to the ASEAN countries to decide which bits of the OECD solution or sets of solutions they want to apply that make sense to them, but it's, a, it's an attempt to put best practice, good information before them. And if we think in terms of uh, how countries take advantage of opportunities, you know, it's one thing to knock down direct frontier measures and put trade opportunities in front of a country. It's quite another for that country to take advantage of those opportunities. And if they have weak infrastructure, uh, there are unresolved issues around regulatory coherence, uh, there is corruption going on, uh, there are all these traditional problems that we all grapple or have grappled with in our past, uh, that will greatly limit their opportunities to take advantage of their integration into both the regional and the global economy. So I think that's what the OECD um, partnership with ASEAN is essentially about. We're happy to be co-chairing it with Indonesia here in Paris, and uh, we're um, hosting two members of the Secretariat in our embassy in Jakarta. And I'm sure that provided, provided we keep a sharp focus on things that matter to the ASEAN countries, I'm very confident we can make a modest contribution to their own excellent efforts. Thank you, Mr. Gosner. I'd like to ask Mr. Sakuma, because he's from the private sector and he uh, is the uh, executive vice president of a, the second largest uh, steel company in the world. Um, Japanese companies have great experience in working in the ASEAN countries. How do you think, because there was a strong plea for investment, they need more foreign direct investment, how can you make, how can ASEAN make the more friendly business climate for the uh, potential investors? Thank you, Kunia san and thank you for the privilege of speaking here today uh, with such uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, I indeed, I've just ran the uh, inclusive discussion is very important for inclusive growth. And I'm pleased to add some remarks uh, is uh, responding to the question just raised, uh, Kunia-san. And first, uh, we strongly support the ASEAN economic community and see it as a golden opportunity to promote further growth and to reduce the disparity in the region. 
It creates a single market economy with free movement of goods, service, and investment throughout the ASEAN countries. For free movement of goods, tariff reduction uh, or zero tariff is uh, very important, but not a full story. Our own experience in the post WTO agreement era, uh, which started in 1995, just uh, resulting from the uh, successful conclusion of Ural Land negotiation, uh, tells us that while the uh, WTO agreement or any FTA reduce or uh, abolish tariff, which are traditionally the tool to, uh, to protect domestic industries. As this tool is scaled back, uh, people begin to consider uh, trade uh, remedy measures such as anti-dumping duties or safeguard measures, a useful uh, defensive tool uh, which can substitute for tariffs. Uh, this uh, result in the spread of anti-dumping duties and safeguard measures, unfortunately. And we have a small or a little concern. The same thing would happen uh, even after the creation of the uh, AEC, uh, because, as I understand, and also the uh, New Zealand minister just pointed out, the uh, uh, after the creation, it will still afford each member, uh, uh, member country, the liberty or the right to take uh, trade remedy measures such as anti-dumping safeguards against other member countries. Um, the, uh, another argument is about uh, non-tariff barrier, uh, technical uh, barrier to trade, and some types of subsidy uh, impede of fair competition, but may be uh, used as substitute for import tariffs. Uh, with a view to ensuring inclusive growth and as a framework of AEC, I believe it is of critical importance to strengthen standards or discipline over barriers, uh, even set up in a legitimate form, uh, such as trade remedies and technical standards. And we must uh, recognize that, uh, most importantly, uh, trade remedies and barriers uh, victimize not only the industry in the exporting country, but also the uh, consumers and uh, industries of uh, importing uh, countries. And then they return uh, growth as a fall of the region. Uh, Protectionism is not a solution at all. And the, uh, this is a case with uh, not only uh, with uh, ASEAN countries, but also any other country, including Japan. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sakuma. Now I'd like to ask the um, middle income countries for ASEAN. There's a strong worry. One of the most frequently asked question is uh, how do countries uh, tried to avoid the middle income trap. After a very rapid growth, countries could stall if they cannot go up to a higher value chain and also to uh, uh, prevent uh, widening income gaps. Uh, they have to um, uh, pre prevent uh, um, widening disparities in income within their countries for inclusive growth. So I'd like to ask uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand, Tovichka Kuchakuli, about uh, what are the priorities for your country to unleash new source of growth so you don't get into the uh, middle income trap and um, if I can have your comment on that. Thank you, Madam. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I thank Japan and OECD for inviting Thailand to participate at the 2014 OECD Forum to discuss the future of Southeast Asia. The Southeast Asia Regional Program is a historic milestone in ASEAN-OECD relations. 
It is a strong commitment to strengthen OECD collaboration with Southeast Asia for our mutual benefit. We are at an important time for ASEAN as the 2015 deadline for the realization of the ASEAN community approaches. Challenges remain, but they are manageable. Meanwhile, we are already working on the post-2015 agenda the OECD can assist. While the spotlight is on the ASEAN economic community, I believe that realizing the full benefits of an ASEAN community can only come when the benefits are inclusive to all nations and peoples of the region. For this, we need economic, social, and political maturity. Hence, you will see a country such as my own participating actively and with full commitment to the AEC, while at the same time also undergoing our own process of democratic and social reform. Economically, we are all focused on regional integration and overcoming the middle income track, trap. The OECD can assist us with these goals. We are supportive of all six areas of cooperation proposed under the Southeast Asia Regional Program. The challenges ahead are great, but the potential benefits of, the, of an ASEAN community are greater. The AEC, with a potential market of over 600 million people and a GDP of almost 2 trillion US dollar, offers great potential for all to tap into. We believe that the OECD's experience and guidance will be very supportive. I look upon the OECD as a club of best practice to work with us through the Southeast Asia Regional Program. I am certain that the regional policy networks on tax, investment, connectivity, and PPPs, regulation reform, education and skills, and SMEs will provide a fruitful means of collaboration that will lead us towards regional integration and sustainable growth. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on the political front, front, as democracy is an important foundation for the sustainability of economic development and equitable growth, we need to support each other to ensure that we achieve strong democracies with accountable and responsive governments that adhere to the rule of law. Actually, I would like to give you an overview of what is happening in Thailand, which has posed a challenge to democratic developments and may have a long-term impact on regional economic integration. But due to time constraint, we have prepared a full version of my remarks, which, in, which includes the current political developments in Thailand, available to all of you. However, it was fortunate that the political unless did not inflict grave damage the fundamentals of the Thai economy. We have been through this before, and we have always bounced back swiftly in restoring our economic confidence and potential. I assure you that you can place confidence in Thailand, remaining a logical destination for your investment and businesses. We still have the amenities and logistics to facilitate your businesses. Our workforce is skilled, and our strategic location in the ASEAN region means that we can efficiently meet the needs of foreign investment and business. Please be assured that the political development in Thailand will not hinder the ASEAN community's goals. The most important factor which will enable the Thai people to move forward and over any political impasse 
is the unifying force of His Majesty the King, whom all Thai people give utmost respect. Lastly, I believe that Thailand's strong economic fundamentals, together with the cooperation between Thailand and OECD through the Southeast Asia Regional Program and the Thailand OECD Country Partnership Program, will lead to Thailand's membership of this important organization in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to ask um, the minister from Indonesia, Mr. Basri, um, how does your country um, try to avoid the middle income trap and move up uh, the value chain? And uh, there are statistics uh, that show that Indonesia, the, uh, the income gap is uh, widening in your own country, and that could be an impediment to moving um, towards the higher income level. Um, what are your priority policies? Thank you very much, um, Kunia-san. Um, first of all, I would like to thank OECD and also the Japanese government for the, uh, organizing this um, event. Uh, but before I address your question, Kunia-san, uh, let me perhaps emphasize about the uh, about the challenges that many Asian ASEAN countries will face uh, in the near future. Uh, looking at this global landscape, uh, I believe that the rebalancing must take place. If you look at the problem in the advanced country with the twin deficit, they've got this current account deficit and the fiscal deficit. I do believe that one day the rebalancing must take place in the sense that maybe the advanced country will become an exporter one day, no longer as the locomotive of trade. And if you look at the problem on the fiscal side, probably some advanced country will move from spender to become savers. And if this has happened, then the question is, who is going to be the locomotive of trade? And the answer is, will be Asia. Why? Because with the growing middle class, you mentioned Kunia-san about this growing middle class, majority of the population will be in Asia with the strong growth. So the center of growth will shift into Asia. And if you're talking about Asia, there are three major pull of growth. The first one is will be South Asia. The second one will be East Asia. And the third one will be Southeast Asia. And if you're talking about Southeast Asia, 50% of the Southeast Asian economy is basically the size of the Indonesian economy. And 42% of the, in the ASEAN population is basically Indonesian population. So we must do something related to this because if one day this rebalancing take place and ASEAN country is not ready, then the question is we are facing a probability of the slowing down of the global growth in the future. But unfortunately, Many ASEAN countries, including my country, still facing about some problems. You mentioned about this, you know, the middle income trap. I'm talking about 75% of the population in Southeast Asian economy will live in urban. If you're talking about this urbanization will take place five to 10 years from now, then the question is, are we ready to prepare for the good quality of infrastructure for public housing, public transportation, clean water? So if you ask me what would be the first step in order to avoid this middle income trap, the first answer is will be providing infrastructure. And this is also the related to the second issue that my, you know, many ASEAN countries uh, are facing now. It's about the rising inequality. You mentioned about this widening gap. I think one of the reasons why this gap uh, happen in many ASEAN countries, not only in Indonesia, it happens in Thailand, it happens in, in, in Philippines and also Indonesia, is because this growing middle class, the top 5%, their consumption, they grow much faster than the uh, lowest 10%. Doesn't mean that poor is getting poorer, but because the rich grow faster than the poor. So we have the problem of this widening gap. So the question is, how do we answer this? Unfortunately, the poor people, they are entirely rely on public infrastructure. Why? 
Because if they are poor, they cannot build their own electricity power. They cannot build their own road. But the big companies, there are some people from the private sector here, they can build their own road. They can build their own port. They can build their own power generator. So it means that in order to reduce inequality, the role of infrastructures also become crucial. That will be the first step. The second one, we are talking about this rising middle class. But one of the problem with the middle class is if you don't create this middle class with the good quality of human resources, this young population, we mentioned about young population, it will end up with this demographic catastrophe. So one way to handle this issue is will be increasing the productivity by including, in, increasing, improving the quality of human resources. There is one interesting development. If you look at the productivity between the United States and the ASEAN countries, it's declining now. Not because the ASEAN countries is catching up with the US, but the declining productivity in the US is declined faster than decline of this productivity in ASEAN. Why? Because the aging population. The ASEAN countries, we do have this capacity of this, you know, the young population. But without good quality of human resources, that will be very difficult. The problem is, we need to provide education, but it takes one generation to get there. So what kind of policy? So let me give a simple example. The ministry, my, my ministry, uh, Minister of Finance now, we provide a tax incentive if company would like to do an R&D in Indonesia, because I think this is very important. I'm not a big fan of the industrial policy. Um, I don't really believe in the industrial policy because it often end up with rent seeking. Government is very bad in picking winner, but losers are very good in picking government. <laughs> yeah, in order, so, in order to fight that. But, but I agree that I think there is a role of the industrial policy in terms of human capital. The government can provide the government assistance in terms of quality of human capital. We do have this training is provided by the government, but unfortunately many of the people who graduated from the government training center need to be retrained again. Why? Because the equipment doesn't match with the, what the company needs. So why don't we ask the private sector to do a training and give a tax deductible? So this is the second issue that we need to focus on. The third one is governance. Um, colleague from, uh, from New Zealand and also from Japan mentioned about the issue of this investment climate. I think we need to admit that you know, one thing that I learned from the process of this decentralization in Indonesia is also we decentralize the corruption to the local government. And one thing that we learn from this process, there is something worse than organized corruption, which is unorganized corruption. <laughs> and we really need, need to look at it, this issue carefully. We need to improve. Yeah, jokingly, I said to my good friend, Secretary Guria, one of the reasons many Indonesian become religious is because they have to deal with the government. If you have to deal with the government, you submitted the document, you never know when this document could be completed. You need to wait. The only thing that you can do is only praying to the God. <laughs> See, if we get this problem, we admit it, then we need to improve about this quality. And I do believe the future of the comparative advantage will no longer the physical capital asset. That will be the intangible one with this policy. So one, the best way to do it is just to introduce a sort of like an IT systems, simplify the regulation, streamlining, and by doing this, I do hope that you know, we'll be able to handle this issue of the middle income uh, trap. Thank you very much, Gunison. Thank you for a very comprehensive analysis and uh, answers to these challenges. I'd like to ask uh, Minister Domingo, what does you think about uh, the threats of uh, middle income trap and how are you going to overcome it? Okay, first, uh, in terms of the middle income trap, the Philippines is just entering the middle income phase, so I think we're kind of five years away from it. Uh, but, uh, uh, it but we do have problems with inclusive growth in the sense that, same as Indonesia, uh, the disparity, I mean the gap between the rich and the poor has not really narrowed down. So we have many programs that are trying to address those issues. Actually, I listed uh, three areas that uh, I think should be addressed or sh should lead the way in terms of so solving uh, these problems uh, in advance of the problem of middle income trap later plus the inclusive growth. And it happens to coincide exactly with Minister Basri's <laughs> three areas, which is, although my order is different, it's governance, education, and training, 
and infrastructure. So what I'll do is just maybe deal, dwell a bit on each area by giving specific examples. The Philippine growth story, uh, uh, we had 7.2% GDP growth last year, and we expect about a 7% average over the next three to five years, was really spurred by the governance uh, efforts led by President Aquino. Uh, he has been unrelenting in uh, pursuing governance efforts, and this has yielded so much benefit, not only in terms of actual investor confidence in the Philippines, but in terms of actual savings in the budget through re much reduced corruption. This has given us more fiscal space. Using the same amount of money, we're able to do more projects. And uh, these efforts are still in full, full blast. So we've tackled very strong things, and currently we are now uh, filing cases against some untouchables in the Senate. So these are very tough uh, things that have, are, have been done and continue to be done. I'm, it was mentioned also education and training. Actually, this is so important. Uh, to, to really solve the inclusive growth uh, problem, the best way really is to level the playing field by providing good education access to everybody. And the Philippines has done uh, a lot of things towards this regard. We passed a law that changed our primary and secondary educational system to a K plus 12 system, aligning it to the international standard. It used to be that primary and secondary could be as short as nine years. So now we've aligned it to a 13 year program, which is the international standard. We have, uh, since we started about uh, three and a half years ago, we have increased the education budget by over 50%, and will continue to increase it by a significant amount every year. We, we undertake a lot of uh, training programs that uh, are done actually in conjunction with uh, the private sector. So in fact, we, the president and a bunch of secretaries, including myself, visited uh, during Labor Day some of the electronics uh, operations and training centers in the Philippines, and we, for example, we have training programs that the private sector does, which are electronics companies, that uh, provide training to over 5,000 people, these three companies that we visited. And uh, over 90% of their trainees are hired by the industry. That's how good the training program is. We also have a lot of collaboration between private sector and the educational system, wherein the curricula or curriculum of uh, many schools have been changed to actually address the specific requirements of the industries. The, and our training uh, group, the TESDA, Technical Education Center in the Philippines, actually provides training to over 500,000 people every year. In terms of the infrastructure, Philippines also has committed, because this is so important in terms of achieving, achieving again the inclusive growth, uh, we are going to increase our infrastructure budget from 2.5% of GDP to 4.5% of GDP by 2016. So that's the strength of the commitment of the Philippine government to improving infrastructure. This is this does not include the PPP projects that will be done, which will be funded primarily by the private sector. And we also, in terms of the infrastructure, we have launched a program which we call the Shared Services Facilities Program, wherein the government provides the tools in conjunction again with uh, either the universities or a private sector group or a community to be able to improve the productivity and the volume of community-based services. Last Friday, uh, we just launched the first what we, uh, fab lab in the Philippines. For, uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar with the concept of fab lab, it's a, it stands for fabrication laboratories. This was an idea started at MIT about 12 years ago. And now there are over 250 of these all over the world. And we just set up the first one in the Philippines. And this is a facility that provides prototyping capability with state-of-the-art equipment, including laser cutters, 3D printers, etc. 
and we make this available to universities as well as to the private sector at a very minimal fee. So those who are not, who are not financially capable are able to utilize these facilities to do their prototyping. So the SMEs will be the biggest beneficiaries of this. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry for that long comment. Thank you, Mr. Domingo. Now lastly, um, I'd like to go to Mr. Nahr, who is a uh, strong advocate for sustainable growth for the area. And I would like to ask him, you've been listening to the comments uh, of all the uh, participants here, and I'd like to see what kind of vision the ASEAN economic community should have as a common sort of vision for the 20 year or 30 years ahead. Right. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Kunya san And uh, you can all tell that I've got the least important job. That's why I come last. And, uh, and because I don't have a serious job like everybody else, I'd be slightly unorthodox and say a few, few things. Um, I think we rely too much on mantras like inclusive growth, green economy, etc so that we can deny realities. Um, so public relations takes over substance. And when I was asked by the OECD, um, and I'm, I'm told it was not a mistake, to write a piece for the yearbook on inclusive growth, I said my title would be Naive Thinking or the Need for Revolutionary Ideas. And my, my view is rather simple, that we cannot have inclusive growth whilst we cling on to 20th century ideas about growth, which is essentially based on exclusive rights. Uh, and this is not an anti-rich or pro-poor kind of debate, but essentially we in Asia, and I agree with many, many things that were said by the minister from Indonesia, et cetera, uh, will define the 21st century, not because we are smarter, some of us do yoga or tai chi, but because we are too many simply too many. So, you know, there are blocks, the ASEAN bloc, China, India. And for the Europeans and Americans, uh, please do not wish on us the things that got you rich. Because we follow the economic model of extractive growth based on promoting relentless consumption through the underpricing of resources and externalizing costs. We will not only damage ourselves, we will damage you too. So please do not wish for that. So my plea to the distinguished Asian ASEAN leaders here is, I think you all know a lot more about your countries, etc. But the primary, primary issue of the 21st century will be understanding limits and constraints. This is not the narrative and the ideological underpinning of the narrative that has dominated the 20th century, which is now being promoted into the 21st century. The 20th century was based on there are no limits, everyone can do everything, and some whiz kids from uh, Silicon Valley will solve all the problems of the world. This continues to be our, our narrative. So I think we will need to redefine in this region, and I know we're running out of time, what prosperity actually means. The assumption or the belief that somehow uh, 4 billion or 5 billion Asians, and I'm going to expand from ASEAN to across the region, can all drive cars, all eat meat, have lawns and swimming pools, uh, is utopian. In fact, it's a lie. It's not possible. Therefore, we will have to think about very different ways of how do we, de de how do we create prosperity that meets the most fundamental human rights of people, which is to have safe food and secure food supplies, water and sanitation. Many of you will be interested to know that uh, more people in Asia today have mobile phones than toilets. I know I shouldn't be saying this before dinner, but, and this often gives me constipation, but this is the reality. So, you know, technology has been underpriced that toilets have become a luxury item, okay? And um, this is how things have become in our world. Uh, we will have to redefine things. So, as I agree with the minister, it's those basic needs. Our consumption, therefore, needs to be on those basic, basic things. Food, safe and secure, water and sanitation, basic housing with which minimum amounts of electricity. Today, somewhere in Asia, something like half a billion people will go to bed without seeing a light bulb. Okay? They are not going to get those lights through you know, windmills and, so and solar. They're going to get it, whether you like it or not, through coal. So the 21st century, my friends, will be messy, 
a lot of that messiness will be in our region. We will have to deal with it and deal with it in ways that will move beyond mantras. And that for me, and I'll finish by saying, requires a fundamental rethinking of how do we define prosperity in the path. It cannot be based on underpricing, externalizing costs, and essentially, if I put it crudely, asking you to buy things you don't need with money you don't have, debt, uh, and rebalancing. And of course, if we're middle class, to impress people you don't like. But that's a different privilege for only a few of us have that problem. And therefore, finally, my point, again, I would agree, is we have to build institutions. And our institutions at the moment are very weak. So again, to the ministers here, please, before we talk about inclusive growth, et cetera, do we have the institutions that allow us to fundamentally reshape the way we view the future? And if I can be so bold, can we stop being subservient to the narrative of the 21st century, 20th century, and create something new? We will have to do that. And with that, we will have to redefine freedoms. Because if any of you have been to an Asian city, you will know that we know more cars, like I need a hole in my head. And therefore, I would argue that we will redefine, therefore, the notion that automotive uh, uh, car ownership is a human right. We will have to shape things very differently using different pricing models, etc. We have to create that narrative, and I would ask our ministers here to be the champions of that narrative, because clearly they, they have that vision, they have the power. I don't have, I can only speak about these things. So thank you very much. Thank you for the thought-provoking uh, comment. Um, I know the time is up and I've been giving the signal, but I have been asked to introduce two people here. And uh, one of them is the um, Japan's Chairman of Budget Committee of the House of Representatives, Mr. Toshiro Nikai. Um, he was a former Minister of Trade and Indus Economy, Trade and Industry, and while serving as the Minister, he was instrumental in creating AREA, which is an economic research in institute based in Jakarta for ASEAN and East Asia. And uh, would you like to give a comment here now, Mr. Nikai? I am the chairman of the budget committee of the lower house of the Japanese parliament. My name is Nikai. I would like to talk about AREA, the Economic uh, Research Institute for ASEAN East Asia and ASEAN's relationship. AREA uh, indeed was established in 2008 by 16 countries, including Japan, China, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India. So therefore, it has been established in 2008. So therefore, we are celebrating the fifth anniversary of area establishment. For the past years, AREA has been active, aiming to become the OECD of East Asia. A very good news that we've received recently um, is the following. In the think tank ranking that is compiled by the Pennsylvania uh, University of Pennsylvania, which um, includes uh, think tanks around the world, such as Brookings Institution and Chatham House. In the category um, of the economic, international economic policy uh, think tanks, um, which include a total of 6,826 think tanks in the world, we were ranked as the 30th of the six, more than 6,000 think tanks. Um, we are extremely happy that our activities were valued in this way, and therefore um, it is, I believe, the sign that our big responsibility in the ASEAN and East Asian economic integration process is recognized. And um, I also welcome um, the fact that the MOU has been signed between AREA and OECD. 
on the area of joint uh, research and uh, policy recommendation. For Mr. Ahed Guria and for Mr. Nishimura, who is the executive director and founder of AREA, um, they participated in the very memorable signing, um, the commemoration of the signing of the MOU between these two institutions. AREA has the strengths um, of a the depth of knowledge it has in the area of economy, trade, uh, investment, and policy in the East Asia countries, uh, including the ASEAN countries. On the other hand, OECD's strength um, is its uh, activity um, of um, compiling statistics um, and analyzing policies and uh, rulemaking um, know-how in the area of economic development, um, development assistance, uh, and expanding uh, free trade. Um, the, indeed, the signing of the MOU represents the merging of the strengths of these two institutions. And I look forward uh, that uh, there will be uh, even more deepening of the analysis and e deepening of the relationship between this, um, these two institutions. Finally, um, I would uh, like to uh, touch upon the uh, natural disasters such as uh, the Thai flooding in 2011 and the typhoon that struck Philippines in the 2013s. As you know from these examples, East, um, Southeast Asian region uh, is prone to many natural disasters. So therefore, uh, we need to focus on uh, the disaster prevention and infrastructure strength strengthening, um, which are the important tasks and challenges of the Southeast Asian region. OECD has the experience in that sense um, in risk management and in the analysis of the financial situations for the reconstruction post disasters. So in that sense, uh, I also look forward that there will be a joint research between area and OECD in the area of disaster prevention and mitigation. Thank you very much for your um, attention. Mr. Nishima, um, Nikai has just said that uh, the memorandum of understanding was just signed between OECD and AREA. And I'd last, lastly like to introduce Professor Hidetoshi Nishimura, who is the executive director for the Institute. Mr. Nishimura. Thank you, Madam. As Excellency Nikai introduced today, AREA signed an MOU with the OECD on the eve of the launch of OECD Southeast Asia Regional Program. This AREA OECD MOU has opened new avenues for contributing to the development and integration of the Southeast Asia, indeed, the fall of East Asia. Given this new joining of forces between area and OECD, I would like to seek the opinion of the esteemed speakers what would they recommend to best use of this new collaboration? Thank you. Um, we are out of time, but since you asked the question, I would like to have one person answer, and who would like to volunteer? Uh, <laughs> minister, may I ask one of the ministers uh, what they would expect of the new uh, collaboration between AREA and OECD. No one wants to go, I'll go. Okay, short one. And I would like to ask the, uh, the chair of um, ASEAN also. Okay, very shortly, please. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chandra. My, my view is that the cooperation we should be aligned the lines that if the 21st century is constrained, then what does development look like? How do we define prosperity? How do we price resources? And fundamentally, how do we redefine access to resources? And therefore, how do we govern? 
And I am always intrigued by the ideological question in Asia today, which we don't have an answer because we are trapped in ideological bins. If you're poor today, would you rather be Chinese or Indian? Thank you, Madam. Also, first of all, I would like to congratulate the signing of the uh, area and the OECD uh, of the MOU. As the, the one of the founding member of area, I am. Uh, I would like to also congratulate and the contribution of area, which has been contributed to Myanmar a long-term development, Myanmar comprehensive development vision which has just completed with the support of ASEAN Japan Integration Fund, JIFE. And this also gave a whole picture, not only for the ASEAN, but for the whole coordination and collaboration program of ASEAN, area, OECD, and the global community. And I fully confident that this collaboration, the OECD and the area, will contribute the global progress and the uh, success of our people in the future that will give inclusive growth, job, and trust between our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that concludes this uh, panel. I'd like to thank everybody, all the panelists, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much.